Okay, Jack and Michael, creators of The Nick. Uh, coming into season two, what were your thoughts, expectations? I mean, season one was really successful, both critically and uh, with audiences. So what were your thoughts going into season two? Uh, I, I think that what we wanted to do was, um, you know, we think we set the bar really high in season one, and so I feel like we really wanted to kind of outdo ourselves and up the ante. And so now that we had sort of set this base of who all these characters were, it, season two really gave us a, the opportunity to sort of drill down in, into them, who they were more, um, their personalities, um, their flaws. Um, I think we wanted to make the city more of a character. We wanted to make it more expansive. Um, so I think between that, making it, making the show bigger but making it more intimate um, with the stories that we wanted to tell about the characters was, was kind of where we wanted to head. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, only that I think for us, you know, thematically, season one was you know, a lot of it was setting our world, letting people understand what 1900 was, and really explaining what the limitations were on different groups, on, on immigrants, on um, the Irish, on women, on African Americans. And so what we, what we did was we explained what the parameters of that world were. Um, and I think in season two what we wanted to do was to show how those different groups pushed back against the constraints of society. So you, you re we really got to see how women, how women in different ways were, were, were trying to make their own way in, in an America that essentially had very, very specific assigned roles for them, very specific careers that they could go into. Um, you know, marriage was essentially the goal for them, um, and making good marriage was essentially the, the really the only the only um, you know barometer of success in a society like that. So we wanted to play that idea with you know between Lucy um, and uh, Cornelia. You know, one goes into a society marriage and finds it to be a prison. The other goes into a society relationship or marriage, and and it really turned you know for her at least she's hoping that it's going to be uh, freedom, um, and and give her everything she always dreamed of. So I think we wanted to play that with African Americans. I think we wanted to show these other elements of their lives. Um, not only not only the, the 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 very specific you know African American only world of dance clubs and and um, meeting halls and intellectuals, but we also wanted to show what it's like once someone's told you what, what, what the constraints are on you, how you then push back against them in a society where it's very dangerous to do so. Mm -hmm. So take us back to the beginning. Where did the idea for this show come from? Uh, the show originated because um, I, at the time, was I was going through a little health issue, and so I um, I was going down different roads of um, treatment, both uh, traditional medicine and functional medicine, and um, I um, and I was really amazed at what medical science figured out. I was really frustrated at what medical science hadn't figured out yet, and I just started to think about well, what would have been my options a hundred years ago. You know, I couldn't go on Google and obsess over things. Um, I didn't have as many options in terms of doctors or or, or treatment. Um, so Jack and I just started talking about it. I mean, my health was was no um, secret to Jack. I mean, we talk about everything. Um, so we just started talking about it, and then at, on a whim, we bought a, a medical textbook off of eBay and. Um, we started looking at it, and it was just fascinating to us. We couldn't, we really couldn't put it down, and um, and so from that, that sort of got the ball rolling, and we started to read more about the medicine of the time, and and then from there we started to read about well, what was life like in 1900, and we we started to read about the history of New York, and it just was just a treasure chest of of, of information and story, and and um, and the truth was much 
much better than fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that's really uh, interesting about this show is, I mean, you talked about doing all this research. It's how detailed it is in all of this, you know, medical stuff, you know, and you're, you're watching them, like, uh, make new discoveries. And, I mean, it's really kind of like, it's jarring at first when you see it to see things like they don't even wear gloves when they're shoving their hands into people's guts and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, how did you guys pitch this show? I mean, uh, you know, uh, was it an easy sell at all? Or? Well, we didn't well, pitch it. Well, the, the key is not to pitch it. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, the key is to show proof of concept. Um, you know, Michael and I were known for comedies. We were known for romantic comedies, family comedies. Um, and um, as a result, you know, we also, also had a career in sitcom. And as a result, we weren't the guys who normally people would uh, associate with a show like The Nick. Um, and so you have to prove you can do it. Um, and there was a few pieces to the puzzle. One of the pieces is that it requires so much research and so much understanding and such a, such a mastery of, of so many areas uh, in terms of, you know, understanding the language of the time, understanding the politics of the time, understanding the social order of the time, the, the makeup of New York City, so that, you know, and, I, and then, then the medicine on top of that and becoming experts in all these different procedures and understanding what was possible, what wasn't possible, and the tiny details. So for us, you know, if we had gone into a, 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 you know, an HBO or a Cinemax or, or any other cable channel or network and just said, hi, we're the guys who wrote funny comedy movie thingies, we want to write this really super dark show, it would never have worked. No one would have done it. We didn't even tell our representatives we were doing it because they would have talked us out of it. And I think in the end, you you have to show the proof of concept and that you can do it. You know, the pitch, I don't think Michael and I ever, ever have gotten that comfortable with the pitch, with mm -hmm. any sort of pitching. I mean, we're good at it. We do it, whatever. We're very, you know, I think we feel comfortable pitching ideas in rooms and, and all that. It's, it's, it's the idea of going in and saying, here's a pamphlet. Here's a pamphlet for um, for a novel. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many ways to execute it, and there's so many ways for people to become to 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 misinterpret what you want. You know, you can say, well, the tone is this, you know, or the tone is that, or it's this meets this. Mm -hmm. But in the end, until you write it, no one knows what it is, and until you prove you can write it. It, there, it, in a lot of ways, it's just it feels frivolous to us, um, you know. So we did a tremendous amount of research, um, and we really educated each other. Michael would spend the day, um, you know, coming up with all this stuff, and we would. The internet is extraordinary, but we'd also be reading different books and and getting you know medical journals and all these other things that we wanted to get our hands on. And uh, and you know we were looking at pictures and 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 trying to understand that society, because 1900 isn't anything we'd really seen that much of. Maybe in a movie like Ragtime, mm -hmm. um, but 1900 wasn't something that people had a real um, familiarity with. So you'd say 1900, and they'd say, "Oh, Gangs of New York," and you go, "That's the early 1860s. That's actually it's the Civil War era in New York." Well, and and in that intervening 35 years, so much happened. Um, in, and then they say, well, what about, it's Boardwalk Empire. We go, no, Boardwalk is really 30 years later, and the massive changes between 1900, when there were no automobiles, really, um, there was no, there, there was no radio, there, you know, <laughs> you know, there, there were people still using candlelight, and, um, you know, it was just vastly, vastly different, and as a result, there were no airplanes, and by the 1930s, people were barnstorming around the country, so, we wanted, we needed to explain to people what this era was, and as a result, we, we wrote the pilot, um, and and we also did something called the lookbook, which was to really explain what visually this, what it was going to look like for a director, for a network, um, so that people could really understand what they were going to be looking at. Mm -hmm. Talk about creating, creating this character, character of uh, Dr. Thackeray. 
played by Clive Owen. I mean, he's so fascinating and uh, so filled with little nuances. Um, talk about putting him at the center of your story. Well, he um, He's based on a few doctors, but uh, sort of our main influence was uh, a surgeon of the time named John uh, Stuart Halstead. William. And, um, huh? William. I'm sorry. I'm so, what did I say, John? <laughs> yeah, we have John Wilkins and Thackeray. Um, right, sorry, John Thackeray. Um, William Stewart Halstead. These three named people are very hard. Yes. Okay. So William Halstead. Sorry about that. And um, and uh, Halstead was a, a brilliant, brilliant surgeon um, of of the era. He's one of the um, creators of Johns Hopkins. He he um, pioneered so many different procedures during his time as a surgeon, but he was also um, a terrible cocaine addict and a morphine addict. Um, so <clears throat> we thought that that was a very interesting place to start. The, just kind of, not so much of uh, Halstead as the person, but why, why is a man who is so driven also addicted to these substances? Why at that time was he addicted? And what, what drove him? And I think we, we took those elements and elements of some other surgeons and um, saw a, the possibility of this incredible um, center of the show. You know, a man who, who is addicted, but he's, he's driven um, not only because he wants to um, succeed, but as Jack and I like to describe it, is uh, these surgeons back then, you know, they were taking incredible risks, and there was a body count behind them that was tremendous. I mean, they would lose. You would go to the hospital. You were probably going to die. You weren't going there to be saved. So these guys would basically be experimenting, saying, well, okay, well, let's try this and let's try this. And over and over, more, more, more than likely, the, per the, the patient would die. So that's a tremendous burden for a person. So how do you keep moving forward? Well, here's this miracle, miracle drug, this anesthetic called cocaine, which the, um, the students were trying on themselves to see the effects of it. And when they, you know, it gave them energy, it gave them a rush, and it gave Thackeray the the wherewithal to, to move forward and to keep moving forward in his in in his um, research and in his profession so that he wouldn't have to look back and he wouldn't have the burden of all this and the burden of the death of his mentor on his conscience all the time um, and so we thought that that was just a really fascinating um, place to to begin the show mm -hmm. yeah I mean it is it it is fascinating because I think that we idealize doctors and, and think that they must be perfect people, but it's interesting to see this, uh, these flaws in him, uh, you know, and yet he is really dedicated to what he does. Um, I want to talk about a point that uh, you made earlier um, in that not only is this a show about medical advances, uh, but it also is about society at that time, you know, uh, the way that uh, black people were treated, the way that women were treated. Um, so talk about rounding out the ensemble uh, and, and finding the right actors to uh, express these themes. Well, in terms of rounding it all out, um, you know, I think Mike and I found all these different things just in terms of the characters on the page mm -hmm. that I think were, were, were moments or touchstones where we started to say in terms of what we wanted in the show, um, you know, uh, we found a picture of these two ambulance drivers uh, standing outside the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. And, uh, you know, you look at them and you would say, these guys didn't look like, and, and they looked like horsemen. They looked like, me they didn't look like medical guys. They looked like the guys who were strong enough to wrestle horses and strong enough to, to move a, move a, uh, you know, stretcher up and down stairs, um, and that they looked more likely to create patients than save them. And the, you know, this guy had a big push broom mustache, and the, the, it just—I looked at it and I thought, my gosh, the, I want to see who those guys are in society. And also, it's not just about the doctors; it's about everybody in this world. Um, I'd read this tiny one sentence about. Um, that in 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 Ireland they had you know they, that one one convent had sent its its troublesome 
you know, uh, nuns to America and actually to the American West. Um, I don't think that was at common, but just that idea of it was fascinating to me. Um, I think we talked about a hospital administrator, um, and we realized that everybody, you know, everybody in that era, there were, was crooked in one way or another. Either you were getting, either either you were you were getting yours or you were having it taken from you. And so we kept playing with it. And I think for Michael, it was really really important to get the character of Algernon right because we wanted to properly portray what an African American was going through in in. You know, in 1865, uh, an African American human being was considered property, mm -hmm. and we're 35 years later. And the idea that a that an African American man, however educated, however brilliant, um, was going to approach you with a scalpel and say, I'll, "I'm going to be your doctor now," in white America, that wasn't something anyone would really um, would really be able to get their mind around. It. And you know, you needed a first to kind of give you that, and um, you know, we're we're still 47 years away from allowing a, man, a black man to play baseball with white people. So, you know, it, 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 so a lot of that was where we rounded out that element. But I think Carmen Cuba um, deserves really the lion's share. She's our casting director, and she deserves the lion's share of the credit for finding, you know, these wonderful, extraordinary theater actors. Really, they're theater actors. Mm -hmm. Um, New York theater actors, and if you look at our, our our supporting cast and our and our guest cast, they're some of the greatest actors living, but they just happen to be, you know, New York theater actors. Um, obviously, I think um, as James Corden showed on the Tonys, um, every New York City theater actor has been on Law and Order at least once. <laughs> yeah. And I think that they've. I think that they're they're also by the time we're hopefully done with our run, they'll all have done at least one episode of the Nick, if not many, many more. But to be able to find someone like Chris Sullivan to play, you know, to play that, to play that ambulance driver that I, that that we saw on the page, um, he's just extraordinary, and he's this big, giant, hulking guy. And I, I admittedly, I don't think either of us saw him as as basically a six foot four you know, hulking man, but when Carmen showed him to us and we saw his audition, that was it. That's him. That guy's amazing. And Jeremy Bob did the same thing for us, which is, I don't know if, you don't know, you think you know what they're going to look like, and then a great casting director puts these different people in front of you and great actors embody them, mm -hmm. and you go, no, no, that's who he is. Um, it's it's almost like when your kid is born and you don't you wait nine months to find out what they look like and then when they come out you go oh that's what you're supposed to look like <laughs> um, you know um, so as a result I think that um, you know I think Carmen gets the lion's share and Stephen is a really you know Stephen gets the final say really in our in our casting and and I think Stephen has an extraordinary eye I mean the number of people of great people he's discovered and put in his movies and uh, other projects, you know, in the end, you always defer to him because you go, uh, he knows how to make it work. Mm -hmm. Which, Which brings me to my, my next, next question, question about, about uh, uh, Mr. Soderbergh. Uh, how did you guys get him involved, and then how did you get him to stick around for 20 episodes? Because, I mean, that's a really unique thing in series television for one man to... Uh, basically say, I'll direct every episode of your show. I mean, obviously, there's a quality to your writing, but, uh, you know, how did he get involved in the first place? It was just blackmail. I mean, we've been blackmailed <laughs> for the last two seasons. Um, uh, our our uh, manager, Michael Sugar, who's at Anonymous Content, they um, he also manages Steven, so he actually got him the, gave him the script. And this was during his, you know, quote-unquote retirement, and we never anticipated that he would be interested in doing it. And I actually thought, well, okay, maybe he'll read it and like it, and that'll be cool. That we could say, oh, Steven Soderbergh loved the script. But um, uh, he, I mean, he'd say it himself, but he, he just, he got lit up by what um, was on the page. I mean, it really, it spoke to everything that he was interested in. And so we just clicked on that in that regard. And I think... You know, Stephen. Stephen really d does what he wants to do, and and so he kind of 
decides how much or of anything he wants to invest in. And, you know, I would, I think we were both floored by the, you know, he, right away he said, um, no, I'm not just going to do the pilot. I'll do the season and I want to, I'll do 10 of these. So that was incredible to us. And then it wasn't long after that where he committed to doing the second season. Um, so it's really, it's, it's really up to him and we're really glad he does. But I think it's just because it's, it's 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 a question of just the the material itself. I mean, it, it's the all the things that we we hit upon, whether it's the, the progression of medicine, race, religion, um, femininity, whatever 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 it is. Um, it's just it's hit that sweet spot for him, and so we are the beneficiaries of that. Um, and I think that he gets to, you know, really get to play on this giant canvas. I think is very very appealing to him as well. Yeah, I think we're just the luckiest. Honestly, we're the luckiest two humans on the planet to be able to have him as a creative partner and really a leading force in this. Um, he works with a guy named Greg Jacobs, and between the two of them, their production and 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 filmmaking prowess are just it's it's humbling uh, to be honest. And the fact that we've had them for you know, 20 episodes, and uh, hopefully going forward, many, many more. Um, you know, we're just, you know, we just, we just really want to be worthy of it. You want to, you know, you want to, you want to put something out there that's worth these people and our department heads and our crew and our act. You want to something that's worth their time, their effort, um, because. You're, you feel so lucky. Um, and honestly, watching Steven do what he does and watching all the roles he fills on our show, you, 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 you sometimes just say, how did I get here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's the... It's, it's gratitude, and then it's put your head down and do the work and be worthy of it. And so we've been really, really lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean... Uh the Emmys have recognized your show um, in its first season. You guys got recognized by the Writers Guild uh, with the nomination. So, you know, what does that kind of recognition mean for you guys for your show? I think it's all just very flattering. It's just all icing on the cake. You know, I, I don't think I don't think any any of us any writer sets out with the goal of winning an award. I think we just want to write what's in our hearts and and um, put out the best product that we can and tell the most interesting stories that we can. And, you know, if any of this other stuff comes our way, that's great. And, and it's really, it's extremely flattering. And, um, uh, you know, you get to go to, sometimes you get to go to a nice party too. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I think it's just, you know, I, 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 I'm just, I think Jack and I just feel like, like you said, we're just so lucky that we get to do the show at all, um, and that's and that the people and that people have embraced it. That those who have embraced it, the critics and all that, that's very very special to us. So, an award on top of that is it's great, but you know we know that's also extremely rare, especially in this time when there are so many quality programs. I mean, it's 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 inc it's ridiculous that to get any sort of notice is it's so hard so we we know we appreciate that yeah i mean i think i think for me the hardest part is just making sure i have a tuxedo and a suit that fit <laughs> um, you know we're writers so yeah you know um, we're, we're not known for our elegance and our and our sartorial splendor so you know for me it's like okay i just have to make sure i have a tuxedo that fits i just have to make sure i have a suit that fits, and I always have to Google the previous award show to see what people wore to find out if it's like if it's a suit one, if it's a tuxedo one, if it's you wear a tie, if you're supposed to, you know, you know, if it's a beach party, who knows, you know. So, um, but honestly, it's you just someone gives you the opportunity, um, you know, you 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 just want to, you're a writer, and you just want to do the thing you do. You love, I mean, for us, the process is so much, it's really what it's about. It's, it's about getting to write it and research it and figure it out and solve problems and figure out how you're going to 
tell something in a way that no one else is hopefully no one else has done before, or you know, and and bring something to it. And then you have this you know, HBO slash Cinemax, who whom whom everyone with whom everybody wants to work, and so that you get to work with them, and that they are so supportive, and you're like, and you're like, wow, I, I you know, another you know, sort of. Once again, you feel like Rocky at the top of the stairs, going, "I can't believe I'm getting to do this," and and then to have Stephen do what he does, and so you know the awards are great, if only because it says that you didn't screw up, that you took all of these incredible gifts that your network is giving you, your your product, your producers are giving you, your your director and your actors and ever and, and they that. You did your part. You pulled your weight, and um, and to and to it even be treading water in the same in the same spot as these shows that I mean, Michael and I we're we're, we're fans. It's just at the Austin Film Festival this week this weekend. You know, it's the TV festival, the ATX festival, and all the writers are doing is we're fanboying, <laughs> fangirling like crazy. I mean, that that was the thing is that you're sitting there and 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 you know, I, I you're, you're talking to people who did shows that you're 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 a gog, and that they love your show and you love their show and and there's no competition. I think when we started out, there was so little real estate on television, and it was really about what gets picked up and what doesn't get picked up. And I think there was a real sense of competition. And it's funny, I mean, Michael, I've been doing this for a really long time, and um. And what was so interesting about the the ATX festival was that we were all sort of saying, "Well, we're not competing with each other." Even though we're, you know the the awards, not we're not. I mean, one person's on one platform, one person's on that platform, one person's on Hulu, one's on on Amazon, one's on Yahoo, one's on and 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 you know we're on Cinemax, and and so you know are we in competition with stars? And no. There's just, we're all doing our thing, and then you go, wow, isn't it amazing that the Americans get to do what they do, and that Game of Thrones is doing what they do, and, and you know, Silicon Valley is, do, you know, my client, what we, first thing we talk about on a Monday morning is, did you see Silicon Valley? I mean, we, I think just so happy to be a part of a time when everything you, everything you watch is, is, is extraordinary, and creators are getting to do really, really interesting things. So, you know, we're in a world where Jane the Virgin can 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 be this extraordinarily wonderful thing that the fans go crazy for. And then you have nine other versions of 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 female driven shows that are nothing like it. Mm-hmm. You know, that you go, wait a second, the catastrophe is really, really interesting with Sharon Horgan and and you're like saying, well wait a second, you know, you've got um, you know, you you've got uh, actually there's a new season of Casual, and 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 you're going around and going. There's all these amazing shows that you're saying that 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 that, that don't just fit into. They're all aiming for one person, one audience. They're they're aiming to to be to 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 pan out and say we're out here. Find us. And when you do, you go, oh my god, my crazy ex girlfriend. Though that's such a different way of going than. Five other really interesting shows, and look, we're a medical show, and there's a thousand other medical shows, mm-hmm. and but ours is, you know, we're we're solving appendicitis, you know, while other shows are 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 doing medical mysteries, you know, up up to the exact moment, and that's what's, it's great, it's it, you know, it's like there's no shortage of canvas, so everyone can paint something. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, it's a great show, and uh, I cannot wait to see what happens in season three. Uh, thank you both so much, and congratulations. Uh, it's a real pleasure talking to you. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Bye.